you've asked me about the role of the student in uh, today's university and the governance of the university. I assume this uh, question arises from the concern of uh, your perception of the concern of many people about uh, student unrest and uh, students or persons fear perhaps outside of the university that students are going to take over. And uh, I have several thoughts that I would like to share with you uh, relative to this question. First of all, it's clear to me that students are not going to take over the university. We have many ways of ensuring that students do not take control. This does not mean that we are not committed to involving students in acceptable ways. We at Iowa State value participation of students through consultation with them and seeking their advice. But we in the administration retain the authority and the responsibility for making decisions. Actually, on our campus, we find that only relatively few of our students care to become involved in the university governance. We have somewhere around 25 or 6 university committees which have provision for the uh, participation of students. We find it difficult to get many students to apply for the positions open on the committees. The same thing seems to be true at the college level and the department level. Students are not flocking to make application for positions on these uh, committees which give them a relatively powerful voice in the decision-making process. So I think, I'm afraid my view of the student body at Iowa State this day, these days is one of non-involvement with university government. And uh, this non-involvement continues until an issue arises, an issue which might affect a sizable number of students personally, and then they uh, tend to want to become involved. And we welcome their involvement within uh, acceptable limits. We cannot tolerate disruption of the university. The regents in February, just about a year ago, passed a very good policy covering the matter of student and faculty disruption of the university. And they said, in essence, that disruption of the enterprise would not be tolerated. And we are prepared to take whatever steps are necessary to uh, prevent disruption. And I think this is the trend across the country these days, if one looks at Hayakawa's handling of the situation at San Francisco State and recent uh, occurrences on the University of Wisconsin campus, it's uh, apparent that university administration will no longer tolerate uh, disruption. And this is certainly the approach that we will use, or have used and will continue to use at Iowa State.
govern themselves. came in the ship. fathers claim the fruits of their land. set fire to one of the buildings on the Berkeley campus and done half a million dollars worth of damage. And all four of us felt the kind of confusion Jim was talking about, the kind of annihilation that students were moving in Berkeley, and a, a terrible pity and sorrow that we have to move in such stupid ways. After our presentation this afternoon, some audience members came up to me and said, in effect, that things in this country were all right, and that if I didn't like it, I ought to go somewhere else. 
and we just can't live that way anymore. There's, there's nowhere else to go, because there's only one world. Mr. F.J. Johnson is Professional Services Coordinator for uh, the NEA, the National Education Association, and ACT, which is the Association of Classroom Teachers. What are some of the problems that you see uh, having some similarity between the uh, educational problems at the present time of the rural areas, which would be of the Iowa, Midwest rural areas, compared to some of the problems that you see as the inner city areas of uh, New York, Los Angeles, Detroit, some of these uh, areas? I think these uh, two kinds of areas could be compared in three ways. One, in terms of the inadequately trained teachers that man those schools to in terms of the physical conditions of the schools themselves and three in terms of the relevancy of the curriculums that are provided at those schools I don't know of any institutions in the country now who are specifically engaged in training teachers specifically to go into the rural areas to teach or to go into the urban areas to teach in general, we find that the schools themselves are in very poor physical condition, and we find that the curriculums, when they are relevant at all, are primarily restricted to providing kinds of backgrounds for the youngsters that will cause them to stay in the areas where they're trained. Which would imply both uh, staying in the rural area as well as staying in the ghetto area. Right. One of the things that we wouldn't want to do in education, if we were to do it properly, is to provide the kind of education for a youngster that would restrict him to an area. In uh, this day and time where mobility is quite great and people move around, it's necessary to train youngsters to move into the mainstream of the American life. Well, this is one of the things I was going to ask uh, next. In to what sense do you think that we can take the youngster with the background that the youngster has, whether it be rural or whether it be ghetto, take it at that spot and then train them to be able to uh, be able to go wherever they want to at a later mature time. Mm -hmm. I think there are some basic skills that all youngsters need to learn. Certainly among these are the skill of writing, uh, the skill of verbal communication, uh, some computational skills, the skills of reading, and from that point, uh, it becomes a little vague as to what is proper or what is necessary or what is needed in training the youngster. But I think an educational system that is based upon giving the youngster an adequate foundation in these skills is one that begins to train that youngster to go into any other educational system and do well. Because these are precisely the kinds of skills that are involved in learning whatever it is you're going to learn. Now, what that is can perhaps best be decided by those individuals who are responsible for making those decisions in whatever area the youngster might find himself. Now, how much do the, uh, the parents in the particular area have to contribute as to how their school uh, functions? Do they have to contribute, one, uh, communicating to the teacher and the administration uh, the level at which they are functioning as a community now? Do they also have a responsibility to say how this is done? Now, historically, uh, education has been a state function, and even a state function by default. Do you recall that our Constitution does not say very much about education? In fact, it doesn't say anything at all about it. 
and as a result, uh, the state assumes that its, its responsibility is to provide education. It has transferred some of that responsibility to, to local administrative units and elected school boards. More and more the idea of parent involvement, more and more the idea of community control or community participation is becoming a popular concept where parents themselves are becoming involved in saying what they think the schools should do, what they think the schools should teach, what they think their youngsters should learn. I think this idea is going to grow. I think it's going to grow because the parents themselves are the ones who have the greatest amount invested, namely their kids. They are the ones who have the greatest amount of concern because the outcome, the future, um, or the life of that youngster is going to depend upon the kind of foundation that he gets in school. I certainly favor more and more involvement on the part of parents in making decisions about what goes on in the schools, about what is being taught, about who is going to do the teaching, and about how the teaching is going to be done. Now, how is this, though, also resolved in the situation in which perhaps the parents are not aware of the um, facilities and of the quality of education that is possible for the children? Well, I think, um, I think what you may be suggesting is that parents themselves are not qualified educators uh, for, for the most part. Uh, how do they know what good teaching is? How do they know what relevant curriculum is? Uh, how do they know what good administration is? How do they know what textbooks, what facilities, what things of that type should be used? I think it's not necessarily th necessary that they know these things. I think what they do know is that they know when their kids are learning how to read, and they know when they're not doing that. Uh, they know when their kids are being treated fairly. They know when the teacher likes the kid and when he doesn't. Um, they know that the youngster likes to go to school or he doesn't. They know that there are conditions in the school that suggest that the youngster would prefer to stay home. And when they know these things, they have every opportunity by participation in PTA or other kind of community organizations to visit the school from time to time to really take a look at what's going on. Now, let me make it clear that I'm not suggesting here that there should be any lowering of standards on the part of persons who are presently involved in curriculum or persons who are presently involved in teaching. I'm simply saying that it may be time, indeed it is time, for us to look in some other directions to get some kinds of advice as to what we might possibly do in the schools. That educators themselves do not have a monopoly on the kinds of information that it is available to have in order to make these kinds of determinations. Now traditionally, uh, the uh, educational system was not set up to necessarily take care of all these far end of the scale. It was mm -hmm. more a, a more for one particular group and to educate one group. Would you like to comment on this? Yes, originally the educational system, I suppose, was set up to, to educate the middle class or the upper middle class. Now we have decided that the educational system should be able to encompass the, the poor, the disenfranchised, uh, the the individual who is culturally deprived or economically deprived, the Appalachian youngster, the rural youngster, the black ghetto youngster, all of these people are entitled and have always been entitled to an adequate education from free public American educational system. But since the schools were originally set up to educate the middle class youngster, and since they have not changed they are totally inadequate in trying to meet the needs of such a broad spectrum. There are going to have to be some revolutionary changes in the concept of what education is, in the concept of how education is to be disseminated, if we are going to meet the needs of all of these youngsters, and certainly we're going to have to do that. And this is going to be varied from place to place? It's going to vary from place to place. I would suspect that the kinds of changes that you might need in rural communities, in our, for example, would be completely different than the kinds of changes that you might need in a metropolitan area like Washington, D.C., Baltimore, New York, Chicago, or Detroit. I suspect that the kind of training that it would be necessary for you to give to persons who are going to teach in these areas would be entirely different. 
I'm sure that something is going to have to be done in order to train teachers in the lifestyles of those people who live in different communities. Something is going to have to be done to give them a greater verbal facility with language so that they can communicate adequately with people who may even speak what might be considered a dialect of English. I think something is going to have to be done in the area of human relations so that people can develop a greater understanding and appreciation for the dignity of an individual simply because he is an individual. I think there's going to have to be some recognition of the fact that the same kind of educational system is not going to be adequate for all of the people in the society. We certainly appreciate you taking the time. Our guest has been F.W. Johnson, who is Professional Services Coordinator for NEA ACT. On the program today, as you can see, we're visiting the Iowa Beef Improvement Association Bull Test Station, which is located about six miles east of Randall. And we're going to visit some of the fellows. We've interrupted their activities while they've been weighing uh, these bulls. First of all, we have Bob DeBaca, Extension Livestock Specialist at Iowa State. Bob, I think, first of all, we might just mention a little bit uh, how this uh, bull test station was organized. Well, actually, this is uh, 10 years since the first time a bull test station was organized in Iowa. The first one uh, lasted two years, and because of some administrative problems, did not continue. Uh, this present station is under the sponsorship of the Iowa Beef Improvement Association, the state performance testing program. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is set up uh, on contract with a family corporation, Greenway Fars Farms Incorporated, here at, uh, well, they actually have a Radcliffe address. Yeah. And uh, the bulls are consigned uh, under contract with the feeders and the Iowa Beef Improvement Association by breeders throughout the state. We have uh, uh, 88 sire groups of bulls owned by 76 different uh, breeders and uh, a total of uh, 282 bulls on test. These bulls have been on test 84 days today and uh, uh, don't ask me what the daily gain <laughs> in the last 28 day period is because the computer will tell us tonight. But uh, these bulls are fed for an average of around 2.75 pounds of daily gain. We had a cattle feeder in here this morning said, say, there's a bull or two in there that uh, I think is kind of the wrong kind as far as I'm concerned as a cattle feeder. And uh, we commented that's what we're trying to find out, which of these bulls are, should not go out and sire feeder cattle. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we're looking on an objective basis of using the research of the last 40 years essentially today, to find those strains of cattle that will go on and really do a job of siring uh, fast-growing cattle. Because we know that margin and gaining ability are the two big factors in determining profit for the cattle feeders. Well, Bob, what information now will you be getting on each one of these bulls? The main information is their ability to grow on test, in other words, daily gain. And we will actually evaluate the bulls at the end of the test on the basis of their weight per day of age. In other words, that's how many pounds they weigh for every day of age they are, and their daily gain. And the bulls will be ranked for sale uh, at the end of this test, mm -hmm. the sale on April 14th, incidentally, right here at the station, <laughs> uh, on the basis of their weight per day of age and their daily gain combined. Well, now, you have several different breeds here, I noticed. We have Angus, Red Angus, Charley, uh, Polled Hereford, Hereford, Shorthorn, Polled Shorthorn, and three, uh, four brown swiss bulls. And as I understand it, the breeds are not competing against each other. Every bull will be indexed against the average of his own breed. And then you mentioned that there will be a sale. I know there, you want to mention there that. There will be a sale April 14th, and only the top two-thirds of bulls sell. Oh, I Only see. the top two-thirds. Now, for a bull to come in here, he had to meet requirements on weight per day of age. He had to meet requirements on birth date and uh, quite a, a number of other criteria that we had set up. Mm -hmm. These uh, bulls are contract-fed. Uh, the breeders are quite interested in what's going on, and I 
feel from the contact I'm having with commercial men around the state that there's a lot of commercial interest in the bull pen. Well, we'll come back to you in just a little bit. I want to talk some of the fellows do the work. We have Byron Wagner over here. Byron, as I understand, uh, <coughs> you have the problem of feeding these bulls. Is that right? No, no problem. It's no just, problem. Uh, huh? Kind of routine. What are these bulls fed? Uh, what kind of a ration are they on? The ration consists of 56% corn silage, 38% additional grain, uh, one and seven tenths pounds per head per day of a supplement. In other words, it's just uh, a regular feedlot ration there. Conventional. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, interesting, I suppose, to kind of watch these bulls. They develop during the uh, test, isn't it? It's pretty hard for me to tell exactly how they're doing because <laughs> we see them 16 hours a day. So You get them on the scales, then you can tell. Right. <laughs> right. Thanks a lot, Byron. Now we have Dwayne Shaver, uh, secretary. I believe uh, your official title, field secretary, the Iowa Beef Improvement Association. Is that well, right, Dwayne? Field man, yes. Yeah. Well, now, what are your responsibilities? Well, I work with the breeders uh, over the state, Dale, and also help with this uh, bull test and so forth. Spend part of your time keeping the Bach in uh, line? Part of the time, yes, that's right. It's a little bit of a job sometimes. Well, I, I can appreciate it uh, would be. Uh, Dwayne, you find as you travel over the state there's becoming more interest in uh, bull testing work? Very definitely, yes. The interest is tremendous all over the state. And at this point, we're pretty optimistic about this bull test. Well, I can see how you would be, because uh, after all, this is the only way we can find out what these bulls will actually do, isn't it? That's right. And uh, you spoil the expect to continue it, I suppose, don't you? Yes, we do. Yeah. Well, Dwayne, good luck to you, and I hope you do have a lot Thank of you. success. We have uh, Carol Sampson over here. I understand he does most of the work. Uh, what are your responsibilities, Carol? Well, I do most of the uh, mixing. You mix the feed, huh? I mix the feed mostly. And Dwayne feeds it to the bulls. Um, my nephew, uh, nephew does the uh, feeding mostly. Yeah. Well, I uh, suppose that keeps you. I should have said Byron feeds the bulls, then, doesn't he? Mm. And he's right. your nephew. Right. And uh, this is a corporation here, as I yes. understand it. I suppose it's interesting to you, too, isn't it? It's uh, pretty interesting to me. <laughs> okay, well, we'll see you later then, sometime when we come up here and the weather's a little nicer. Okay. Um, getting back to Bob DeBaca. Bob, um, I mentioned there to uh, Dwayne if he's finding increased interest. Uh, do you find the same thing out in the state? Oh, there's no question about it. You see, we have, uh, as I said earlier, 40 years of research on this whole uh, beef cattle breeding thing. We, we know through our investigations out in Iowa feedlots that we've got to have cattle that can graze. Mm -hmm. you, you put a pencil to it any way you want to, and it, it's there. It's there. And the cattle, cattlemen are knowing it. There's an interest in such things as crossbreeding, performance-tested bulls, uh, weaning more ca heavier calves, calves that go into the feedlot for a shorter period of time. And I understand there are uh, similar testing uh, stations in other parts of the country. There's about 35 bull testing stations. We're not doing anything new, uh, Dale. As a matter of fact, uh, in Montana alone, over 5,000 bulls were tested. Is that right? Year. So we're, we're, you might say, bringing up the rear in a certain <laughs> sense, although we've been uh, giving leadership and concepts to some of the other areas, too. But uh, we're... We, we've got some going to do right here. Uh, have you checked with any of these other stations, uh, made a comparison of how these bulls are doing? <laughs> you bet I have, for the simple <laughs> reason that I wanted to justify how our performance was doing. At the end of 56 days, we had a 2.7, just about a 2.7 daily gain on all the bulls. And uh, this has not been an easy winter, Dale. <laughs> this is no, a, that's for <laughs> sure. The radio man might not know this, but then... <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, with... Uh, with uh, the winter the way it's been, I've been concerned about our gains, so I called out to some of the other stations. Uh, Stanford, Montana, for example, 70 days on test, and they hadn't been able to get through the snow to, yeah. to weigh. Uh, they've had mortality because of weather. Yeah. Ogallala, Nebraska, they haven't weighed yet. And uh, we're right in line with uh, Virginia and, uh, and uh, some of the Nebraska stations and so forth. I'm real pleased with the way she's rolling. Well, good luck to you, Bob, and uh, we'll follow this along um, as it proceeds. And the uh, sale again is April 14th, right here at the station. Thanks a lot. Bob DeBaca, Extension Livestock Specialist here at Iowa State. Today we've been visiting the Iowa Beef Improvement Association Bull Test Station east of Randall.